All right, thank you everyone for coming. Today, uh, my name is Aidan Gallagher, and this is my partner, Ahmed. Uh, we'll be talking about our fourth year project on the programmable surface via an array of linear actuators. Um, this is in conjunction with our fellow Nano graduates, Myodic Enterprises. Uh, thank you for attending, Asif. And uh, let's go. Okay, sorry, there we go. All right, so a brief introduction to the problem and the whole inspiration for this project itself. Manufacturing is a huge industry. Molding, particularly, is used in a variety of fields. Oftentimes, say molding sheet metals and customized surfaces, it's very difficult and there's lots of wear and tear over time. Molds break, they get damaged, and they get defaced. <coughs> over time, they're sort of replaced or swapped out. So this causes downtime in factories. Downtime equals huge losses and huge amounts of money to are wasted. In theory, if you could reprogram the surface and reprogram the mold the way you want it to be, you could skip the downtime and save the money. Alternatively, this technology should be used as a uh, customable topography map. Okay, so more on our solution. Uh, so, so he just said that we can use it as a, as a custom mold. So this means that we can make any shape that we want, we can have any mold that we want, uh, and it also decreases the downtime because when a conventional mold gets, uh, gets chipped or cracked or anything, then you need to buy a whole new mold that's like $500,000 out of the, out of the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the company's pocket. And it also re reduces the, uh, the downtime when you're switching between two different products because you don't need to switch out the molds. You can just input a new, uh, a, a new mold. Um, so this gives more control to the manufacturers and it also allows you to rapidly prototype when it, when it comes to manufacturing. Like right now, if you want to design and test two different types of, say, a car door, then you need two different molds, and each mold is very expensive. Here you can test and iterate each design that you want without any downtown, without uh, having to buy more than one mold. All right, so the inspiration behind this uh, is actually uh, rail guns. Um, these are based on the Lorenz force and the actuation uh, using metro magnets. So it's all the way handle, right? You have the actual magnetic field in one direction and the current perpendicular to that. And then finally, you get an orthogonal force going in the direction you so choose. If you inverse the direction of current, you get force going the opposite direction and you can retract or push the pins up and down. Uh, of course, the force is going through the right hand rule. And uh, it's, we actually use permanent magnets. Uh, we're not creating magnetic channels like a railgun does. Um, but the actual red force, the idea is exactly the same. And how we implement this, like this was our initial design, is we wanted to make a titanium pin with a sensor that gives us a feedback on the position of the pin. Um, and we also wanted to uh, uh, generate the magnetic field that's needed by using uh, coils, but we ended up using uh, permanent magnets and an and ABS pin, uh, as we'll show you in the next slide, um, which is right here. So, the, uh, the, the, so this right here is what we have outside. You, you can see that there's two copper rails which provide the current to the ABS pin and the, uh, and the wire that's going across it. Uh, you, uh, you have a magnetic field that's going up and the current is going across that wire and, and then you generate a force that pushes the pin up. Uh, and then when we stack these together, we get the three by three that we have. Um, we, as I said, we're using a permanent uh, magnet rather than a coil generating uh, thing. Here we go. All right, so there's a couple of main forces to really have to worry about here. Of course, the actuation force from the Lorentz. Um, you have force of gravity, it's always going to be there pulling down, and of course you have friction as well. Uh, the two that are really the big concern would be friction and gravity. Uh, gravity is always trying to bring you down, of course, and the friction is just getting in the way and causing more and more force you have to overcome to actually actuate the pin. But you can see right here that we've shown it on a 45 degree angle. Um, this was a design choice which results out of the inability to actually produce a vertical actuation. Um, horizontal actuation is very easy. You get good contact, you apply the current, the pin moves. It doesn't retract, but you can create a circuit to pull backwards and it's totally fine. Vertical, however, has certain contact issues. It's difficult to actually maintain full contact, not too much friction. Too much friction gives you more contact, but you can't overcome that force. So it's really a kind of balancing game between these two forces to get to the point where we went for 45 degrees. It's the best of both worlds, and it actually works quite consistently. Uh, here's some basic numbers. Uh, kind of back of the envelope calculations. Uh, the actual coefficient of friction between copper and copper contacts uh, is about one, and given the 45 degree angle, actually counteracts the effect of gravity quite well and provides some decent contact. Um, the field itself we used 
Uh, they're N52 grade uh, neobinium magnets. It's the strongest ones we could find online. It gave us a field of roughly 0.057 Tesla at the distance. Uh, these are rough calculations. Uh, from the manufacturer, they kept telling us that don't trust anything we say, don't trust our own calculations, magnets are weird, and the only way to do it is to test it. And that's the best we could say. Um, all right, all right, so um, going, wait. Uh, okay, go and in addition to this, we actually introduced a very, very, very light magnetic coating onto the pin itself, which pulls the actual device towards the contacts and uh, provides even better contact to stop slippage and uh, loss, loss of contact. Uh, this was very, very finicky and very tricky to get uh, because it's a very, very strong coating and we needed only a couple drops. Too much and it would stick at top and wouldn't fall back down. Too little and you lose contact. So it was a, it was a balance game to really get this to what it was. But Succeeded. So going back on, we, on what he just said, uh, the force that we got wasn't, uh, sorry, the, uh, the field that we got wasn't actually 0 0.057. Uh, that's the force that we need to overcome gravity and friction. What we actually got was 0 0.53, so uh, an order of magnitude more. Uh, also, like he said, there were a, a few like, issues that we had, and that's uh, uh, the friction, which is from uh, the contact surface, uh, like being rough against the pin and the, and the, and the wire. Uh, uh, we also had like deformation due to the very strong uh, magnets that actually like deformed our ABS enclosures, which caused more friction. Uh, obviously, like machining and 3D printing, there's uh, some issues there. Uh, but then, like I said, uh, the force, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, the magnetic field that we got was actually a lot greater than what we needed, and that's why it was able to overcome both fr uh, the friction and and the gravity. Right, so we've talked about the problems we had, right? Oh, sorry. So, so why do we even want to use it in the first place, right? It's not very convenient. We have a lot of struggles. The reason is that you can scale this down much, much more effectively than current methods for programmable services. Um, right now, and this has been done before, groups have tried this to create a customizable topography based on actuating uh, pistons. Uh, these work quite well, and they're all the force you can get, and they're quite robust and quite strong. However, there's two things that are bad. They do not scale down very well whatsoever. And there's a lot of back-end complicated technology to actually make them work reliably, which can break down easily. And why do you want something to break down when you're trying to stop downtime, right? It doesn't make any sense. So that's what this advantage is. It's, it's much, you can scale down much more easily. And the only moving part is the pin itself. That's it. You apply current, it moves. Take the current, it goes back. That's, that's literally it. So it's much, much simpler once fabricated. Um, it's very flexible as well. You can create very few shapes. Um, in our design, we did not succeed in creating a variable height as a binary system, but in theory with sensors, you create a customizable topography with different height levels. Different pin shapes, different pin sizes, all contribute as well. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about our design process and what we had to go through. So this is one pin out of the nine that we have outside. Um, like I said, we 3D printed the enclosures and the pin. Uh, we made uh, the contacts and the wire using uh, machining, uh, they're just pure copper. And in the future, which we're gonna talk about in a bit, we wanna use PCBs and, and eventually uh, like lithographic uh, techniques. Uh, what this will do is it will really like decrease the size of our pin and make it uh, a lot more like stronger because right now the 3D printed, uh, 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 the 3D printed material that we have is, is weak and it can't really withstand the forces that we want it to. But a further look at the enclosures. Right, so this shows a, uh, a series of evolution of our four enclosures. Uh, I remember in the first part of the design symposium, uh, Professor Aziz told us that you should make one design, one design only, and then make that, and that's your project. Um, quite honestly, I think we disagreed. We tried many, many, many different things to get to the point where we are today. Um, as you can see, we started off with smaller magnets, smaller support structures, thinner walls. Uh, the next version moved on to having uh, support structures to stop the magnets from bedding in. Um, it turns out that those actual support structures on the brown diagram uh, cause more cantilever deflection, which increased the friction and actually stopped the pin from moving, uh, quite the opposite effect we wanted to. Um, third and fourth design are quite similar, large mags again, a bit thicker plastic, and uh, more clearances, um, always more clearances for more and uh, less friction. Uh, the pin, oh, sorry. Go. Cool. Okay. So next was the also the pin evolution uh, to go along with the enclosure. Um, similar things, there's a kind of four iterations we used going from very, very large pins to much smaller. Uh, we tried a <coughs> large pin here. The pin weight itself is always going to be a factor. Um, the effects of sliding contact. Um, next was actually the wires. We tried triangular wires, diamond-shaped wires, square wires, um, big and small, how they fit in, how they contacted, the length of the wires. Um, the actual topology itself, the surfaces, 
flattening the contacts was a huge issue. Make sure it's actually fully flat to maintain contact. Um, and the tolerances themselves and the pins. Uh, 3D printing is accurate enough, but it still has a certain room of error. And then trying to balance out, like I said, the friction and the contact in the right amount at the right time is uh, a very, very tricky business. And then finally, the manual coating, which was applied um, and really discovered early last week, um, really put things together. Yep. So just like further uh, talking about the challenges that we had, like Aiden said in the beginning, we, our goal was to make a vertical actuation, but due to the contact uh, between uh, the, uh, the contact that's providing the, for, uh, uh, the current and the wire, we ended up uh, like going for a 45 degree, which maximizes the amount of contact that we had and not having too much friction, which was uh, the case in, in the horizontal. Um, uh, the pin weight, as, as he said, we really decreased the pin weight. Uh, I don't know why this isn't playing. It's supposed to be... No, it's not an action video. Okay. Um, but yeah, so we decreased the pin weight so that it moves. And then we also changed the enclosures so that they didn't deform. So this was the first enclosure that we had. You can see that it, it deforms. Sorry, uh, the third enclosure that we had, uh, uh, the one with the rails. If you look at the scale bar, you can see that the deformation is around, um, how much is it? So 12, it's 12, it's, it's uh, 0 0.12 millimeters, uh, which, is, uh, which was enough to cause a lot of friction on the pin. So it, it didn't move up and down. But then when we iterated and moved on to the next uh, design, the deformation decreased a lot. Uh, these are some SolidWorks uh, uh, simulations that we did. Uh, we want to make it clear that they're not like perfectly accurate because uh, it is a free version of SolidWare, uh, of, uh, of like Simulator Express that we use, and it's not the full version that has the full like capabilities. And, and furthermore, whenever you do these calculations, of course, in the simulation, yeah. uh, choosing which surfaces to, to fix and which ones to use, how you mesh it, how the force is applied, right? We, we, we said that based on the calculations from the manufacturer, um, between only two magnets, about there's 52 newtons of force. Um, spreading that out over the contacts is not going to be totally spread out equally. Uh, it won't deform exactly the same way. There's probably more force when you have series of four magnets in a row. Um, there's a lot of non-idealities, but these kind of simulations helped us show exactly how it was deforming and you know, the source of what was actually happening, uh, even if the numbers weren't totally correct. So uh, the, the final modular prototype, uh, like we said before, this is one of nine units which kind of sub-assembled together to create this array and this grid. Um, it's shown in this picture here. You see that there's the, the top and the, the bottom enclosures, each carrying a magnet, two copper contacts inside, and then the pin uh, going within, which when you apply the current, it actuates at uh, 45 degrees. So the future work. Um, obviously, you want to control the height. If we want to make 2D surfaces and molds, then we need to be able to create shapes and anything that we want on, on these things. So the way we're going to do that, there's two, uh, there's two options that we've looked at pursuing. Uh, we want to use pulsed current so that we, like we do like a raster scan uh, the way this, uh, the same way that a TV works. So we'd pulse one pin like very fast and then we'd pulse the next pin and, and then come all the way back around so that you, uh, you can overcome uh, the friction but then not use a lot of current. Uh, and the second way we, we want to do this is add a variable resistor so that as the pin is moving up and down, the resistance changes and we can calibrate that to see exactly where we are. Um, and then we also want to scale down uh, the way we, uh, we want to do that, as I talked about, is implement some uh, PCB fabrication techniques. Um, also, as we're scaling down, there's some, a lot of issues that we're, uh, we're going to face, uh, uh, primarily heat dissipation and material selection. Um, so, so that'll be v like very critical uh, for us to, inv to, to investigate. Um, also, since uh, these will be used in, in like factories, uh, it's, 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 it's very crucial that the operator, like whoever is using it, can input uh, the mold shape. Uh, so that's why eventually we need to do like a, a user interface and input so that it's not just up and down. It's, it's a shape. Okay, hold on. Um, and just give some numbers behind this. We say application pulse voltage. That's just to create the current. Uh, right now we are operating at around 5 amps. It sounds very high, but the resistance is very low. The voltage isn't actually high, maybe 1.4, 1.5 volts. Um, in the future, theoretically speaking, we'd like to get up to 10, 20, 50, even 100 amps pulsed, um, which in theory would create a lot of heat, but if you pulse it fast enough, 
um, it would actually not create so much of a problem. Um, and, and back to materials again, right now for our, our prototype we used for the copper contacts, C110 is a pure, pure copper alloy, 99%. Um, that is already showing signs of wear and degradation just from the friction of a very lightweight. Um, metal and metal contacts are not known to be incredibly reliable and they do have inherent friction from surfaces. Um, the topology there is, there's a lot of issues. So likely alloy selection play a huge role. Um, titanium alloys for the pins probably. Um, maybe some beryllium copper alloys for those. Uh, there's a lot of actual assets that really have to go into making this a commercially viable product. Um, but given what we've seen here in the analysis, uh, we do think it's possible just with a lot of um, solid engineering work to be done. So we'd like to acknowledge our advisor, Professor Ting Sui. We'd like to acknowledge uh, the 3D print operator, Nikhil uh, Baudu, for helping us out. Uh, we also will, I want to acknowledge the University of Waterloo uh, for providing this learning experience and Myotic Enterprise at the back for giving us uh, advice uh, and direction and also Velocity for allowing us to use uh, some of their equipment. Any questions? Oh, and thanks to our group members, Sam and yes, Gerba, who are manning the booth right now. Outside. Thank you for all that. So, questions? Anyone? You have got one? Uh, yeah. Go Start off, just to remember everyone else. Uh, so, you've got the, what was it, 52 magnets? Yes, no, yeah. magnets. And so, you've got a coil in there. There's no coil. No, there's, there's no coil. There's solid permanent magnets. <coughs> So the coil was going to be used to generate the magnetic field, yeah. but we ended up just using uh, permanent magnets okay. to generate the magnetic field. The no, so that was the initial Sorry. design. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, so what's generating the, where's the current flowing? Yeah. Oh, it's so slow. It's kind of slow. Sorry. So the current's going uh, from the contact into the wire that's across the pin, yeah. and then down the other contact. It's one of the initial slides. Yeah, it's, it's way at the beginning. It's going to take some time. If you want the, the true prototype and actually how it's working, there are booths right outside. And oh. I'll show you. Yeah, it's right there. Oh, and it's yeah. function, so. We'll still go to this. We'll though. still go to this to show you what we actually need. Oh, my God. But we, we do not use any coil magnets. Right here. OK. Yeah. So, okay. so the yeah, permanent magnets will fit inside these slots right yeah. here. Okay. There's, there's the one that goes on top and one goes on bottom. And then the copper contacts actually sit on top and do two purposes. They, they keep the magnet in place, and while this wire sits across the contacts and carries the current. Um, what's kind of cool is that the fact that the magnets actually keep the hook together and pull it all at to one unit. And uh, yeah, I think Lawrence it's like that. Yeah. Has, uh, rail guns that have been known to explode when they apply the they didn't calculate their force in front of Yeah. Okay. So um, that, that shows what was your ferromagnetic coating? So the <laughs> Rust-Oleum uh, paint was what we used for the pins. Uh, it actually, very, very, very strong paint. It's magnetic. Out. It's very magnetic. No, it's it's metallic. Metallic. Yeah. Yes. So oh, it's okay. likely some kind of iron powder that's yeah, pushed just, in the solvent. Yeah. It's just iron powder. But it's paint. very viscous and incredibly concentrated. And even putting one or two drops would completely stick our pin to the magnet with no other force. So we actually had to put like a drop on it, spread it out, and that was too strong. So we had to put a drop on it take some off and then dissolve some and even then they maintain enough force to, to keep it against it. So that was actually one of the most um, headache inducing parts. moments, trying to figure out how little can we magnetize the pin to maintain contact. My and still, uh, is there any significant, oh I see the notches. So yeah. there is a significant so notch. So those notches, um, mm -hmm. they, they put the space for the wire to sit in and actually I guess, where the wire goes. Uh, and we put some money on the pin design so we could actually choose where to put the wire, so how much actuation we get. And then eventually we it also saves a bit of weight and we can move wire on, so it just keeps them in there, and then it's, it's good to go. For our design, though, um, we use these seventh notch down because that gives a good balance. Of, even when the pin is fully actuated, the wire is still in the middle of the magnet, which is the highest point of magnetic force. So when you apply the current, it goes right back up. Okay, so when you apply a current, it's designed to pop up, yeah. yes. and then dislodge. And when you and then release the current, it, it just locks. Back down. It goes back down to where it was. Goes back down to where it was in, in terms of making with that buffed in? No, no, so it's, it's, it's like this. So, so these things, are the pins, are all the way down when it's not on, yeah. like the black pins. And then when you turn it on, when you, when you apply a current, it moves up. And then we turn it off, gravity uh, pulls it back down. It's a binary system, on or off, up or down. Okay, 
Okay, so how do you determine whether it locks on, it looks to me like it's locking on the slide of contact. So, oh, I see. Okay, so, so it's not detaching. No, it's not. So it's just sliding. And it's guided by the actual kind of okay. U-shaped channel. Now so I've got these all assembled together. And the really difficult challenge, like Tom Shingham said, is figuring out the exact space in here, how much width you can find on either side of the pin, right? Is like okay. 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 millimeters, is that enough to do to do friction? And then the top clearance as well, yeah. right? You want to have okay. contact, not too much. And then got it's... It without arc welding as well. Yeah, no. Okay. Oh, we a actually little bit. get some... Some, some sparking. Uh, sparking. Yeah, yeah, with lower this kind voltage. of current, you're going to be be getting very close to electromagnetic pulse generation, so careful with your electron. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so last uh, couple of questions. Um, I think I see Khan from a couple of years back. Yeah, he's, he's right there. Yeah, okay. Hi. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you knew about each other, or yeah. maybe you yeah. are each other. He's, he's, a, he's, yeah. he's my Uric, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, okay, it's all coming clear. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Fine then, you should touch up. <laughs> okay, um, and um, how did you come about the name? My Uric? It Not comes easy, but. <laughs> okay. Of the uh, no, core type or the company itself? The name. The name oh, of the company. Oh, I believe my Uric is based upon the Greek. Like it's well, it's with Plato philosophy, the mighty philosophy of learning of uh, shapes or something like that. I, <laughs> <laughs> something based in nature. It means it means like adjusting to your environment, and I think it's yeah. Socrates, not Plato. Socrates, okay. yeah. Socrates, okay. Plato. Okay. Yeah. Right, so, man. And a philosopher. <laughs> Thank you. I'll look it up. Asif, Asif can tell you much more detail. He improved. Okay. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so you know, I'm confused about how how the displacement of a pin is controlled. Is this, is this an open loop? So like, how do you it's a binary system, so when you run the current, it's pushing force the entire time, and then it reaches a maximum limit, right? The wire cannot pass beyond the kind of threshold, yeah, so, so it just so stays then there. Then how do you and then you so as of right now, we don't have the high control that you're thinking about. Exist. Like that's in the future, okay. like we want to implement, so what we would do is we would add a resistor to the side here, from here yeah, all, 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 there's many all the way down, yes, um, and then somewhere. As it moves up and down, the resistance changes, and we just calibrate that to see where the height is. Like that's one of the ideas that we have. We need a feedback in the Getty controller. And yeah. Lots of other, um, a lot of electronics. Background that software, which was out of the scope of this particular project. Yes. Like, not to mention the locking mechanism came up there and other issues, but for okay. this itself, we'll see fluctuations. Okay. Yeah. So then, the second question, you, you should know is coming. <laughs> How's it now? Go to solve. No, 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 no. <laughs> Shut up. The solve works. Oh, yeah. Fine element and now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should have known. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, we thought it was kind of, yeah. yeah. It's towards the end of the, the presentation. Yeah, yeah. this is going to take a few One minutes. One second, just leave it. This is so. still. What's, what's the question? Anyway, you don't, I don't need to see the picture. Okay. So <laughs> we'll play a video. That looks so good. You, so so, so you, you, you said a lot in this, in this slide. Yep. Um, and, and one of the things you said was that you don't believe that this is going to be very accurate. No. I mean, we think it's accurate. We, it's not the most accurate representation that we can get. Okay. I think it's know, what, what, one of the reasons why you know, engineers get paid in big bucks is not to have just an opinion, but it was important. It's yes. Qualitative. So my question is, this is it. what assumptions went into this simulation? Right, okay. So this is a mostly qualitative analysis using Solvers Express, which is a very um, light version of the actual simulation. So essentially, you pretty much pick your fixed surfaces, right, which you assume are not moving whatsoever. Okay. And for those surfaces, we said that the ones which are locked in and fully enclosed would be around here, and those ones are completely immobile, right? It assumes that these parts will never move, they displace by zero, they're completely perfect. Everything else is open to expanding according to the forces, right? Then you choose your force, right? I said 52 newtons would be applied over this surface, right? This is the whole part, right? This corner. You have 52 newtons over that entire thing. It's about 400 millimeters squared. And you have like and that 52 newtons is based 60 kilopascals. Yeah. Yeah. If you try and rewind all the way back to this course I saw, um, I, I mentioned when we were talking about Continue. infinitesimal elasticity theory yeah. that going any farther is really, really complicated. Mm -hmm. And so SolidWorks, you know, they they don't they they use this complicated theory, mm -hmm. this quantified deformation theory, and a lot of the stuff that go into it. The accuracy is highly dependent on more than just boundary conditions, right? So, I mean, there are phenomenological relationships between quantities, these tensors that you guys hate. I love tensors. So, I, I definitely, you know, you should be very careful in the future, in your future jobs when you, when you bring up 
these. Oh, trust me, I would never. Just kind of, I would never show this in my job. It's quite old and now it could mean anything. So no, it's it's accurate. Don't don't listen to that. Right. Yeah. It's, it's not doesn't doesn't quite solve mechanics. That's just a misnomer. So you, you so, so you're so talking about like the. I'm just, okay. Really, I'm just being kind of a bit, a bit malicious. I'm oh, sorry. Being a bit so like we should look yeah. into how yeah. how the solid works like generates yeah, like this sort of thing. You weren't, you weren't taught that. I mean, it's no. very complicated. So yeah. I'm right. not expecting you to come up with the, the equations, but definitely that's 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 one of the main area of accuracy. Is not just your boundary conditions. It's how the model they works itself. Yeah. yeah. So, so last and question I really don't, uh, I, I, I guess I must ask. Um, so you have some relationship with a, a UW startup. Yes. That does involve graduate students and others. They're not graduate students. They're, actually, yeah, they are graduates. Yes, no? yes. <laughs> Sorry, yes. I, I know who they are. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so, One of so them is your student. You probably need to, you know, in order for us, for, for us to evaluate what you've done, um, distinguish what you've done versus what they've done. Uh, have they acted as consultants, or have they done? So has any part of this work? Um, so we did all the work. You did all the work. Yeah. yeah. Every single model you saw drawn, we saw drawn all by ourselves. Okay. Every single That's thing you built today, every machining, every three D print they design. They were basically consultants. Yeah. Yes. We said, okay, here we'll try this. We started kind of breaking your screen up and said, what's going on? In your blurb, it says this was developed in conjunction with. So they gave us the initial idea. Because that's what they're doing for their startup, and then right. we just went out and we and we developed it. And we also work in parallel, right? So as we've been this, right? They've already moved on to the next phase of PCB development and trying out those methods, right? And they've taken inspiration from what we've done here, and okay. they've kind of taken that and drawn upon it to, to move their own designs along. That's a non-standard situation. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's fair. Um, don't worry, we didn't just copy their design and print it and come here. Okay. I, I trust you. Not the case. Um, but to to go on your, your thing about modeling, if we were to actually do a thorough proper analysis, that we trust we would do more of this. Um, like Comsol, if you can import solvers' bodies into Comsol and break it down yourself a bit more thoroughly, um, I heard that's more. Uh, we, we, we can talk afterwards. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a solver mechanic. So yeah. I guess. I mean, either. do you have yeah. any questions? Questions from audience? Anyone? Anything? Awesome. Okay. Good job, guys. Okay. Thank you.